I will start by apologizing, apologizing. I'm not sure if I will be able to deliver on saving your sanity because sometimes you're just too far gone, um, but I'm sure we'll try. Okay, so a bit about me. Um, um, uh, as I've been introduced, my name is Marcelo. Uh, you can reach out to me in all different places. I'll try to reply. Um, I've been um, sort of tinkering with Elixir since 2014, but actually started coding seriously in 2015. I'm a CTO and co-founder at Remote. Uh, we're a fully Elixir stack company and team. Um, the things that I usually care about is, is efficiency, productivity, scalability. Th these are the topics that I'm mostly uh, super fond of. Uh, of um, if you want to discuss it with me, just reach out. I'm super happy. Um, and these are my two colleagues and kids, uh, my son and my dog. So um, on to more traditional approach. On, on today's um, um, talk, uh, the typical table of contents. I'm just gonna go through this very fast. But we're gonna, I'm gonna do a bit of intro to let you understand why I came up with this and, and why does this matter for me and for the community in general. Uh, I'm gonna present a bit about the four patterns and how they impact uh, uh, a code base, how they work, and, and a bit of an example as well as a case study so that we can actually see how it works rather than just me labbing through it. And, and then we'll have some hardcore results. Why hardcore? I don't know, it just felt like adding it to the, to the title it looks nice. And then a key, some key takeaways. Hopefully this will be fair and short and you'll like it or not. Just let me know. So on the intro side of things, um, as usually when you go to the doctor, they ask you where does it work, hurt and why are you here? So I've, throughout my 11 years of experience, um, I've been in more than seven companies. Uh, so to what it feels like a million code bases in different programming languages, Java, Go, C++, Python, Ruby, and ev eventually Elixir. Uh, I felt that scaling these companies were, of course, different in all, in, all, in all cases, but very similar in the type of pains that happen with it. Um, these are very common. I'm sure most of you felt it or, or went through it. Um, code base structure as you scale and add more stuff to it. The logical style guides um, and contract between the actual code in it and the continuous need to refactor, be it for positive reasons or more negative reasons that take you to technical depth. Um, and um, this is exactly what led me to think, how can I solve this from an efficient point of view? Because keeping doing the same thing uh, across different um, languages and frameworks it gets a bit boring and repetitive. So there must be a way to fix this. Um, and I think I found it, um, uh, something that helps me tackle this without, of course, going into bigger architectures, uh, especially for upcoming uh, teams and startups uh, or, or companies altogether, uh, without having the overhead of having to think from the beginning about um, um, a domain-driven development or an hexagonal structure, which to be honest, in most cases will, will be great, but the effort that takes to put into it um, just, just not, doesn't fit uh, the team speed or requirements of, of the business. So uh, to back up my claims, I did have a bit of a, an intro uh, with a few questions. It, took, it, it had over 117 people uh, answering it, uh, to whom I'm very thankful. Uh, and there were a few questions that I'd like to highlight and to picture this. So to the question of, do you believe your code base should be improved or could be improved? Almost 80% said yes, of course. I think we all always want to do it. I have yet to, to meet an engineer that doesn't want to over-engineer at some point of in, in his life, and that's fine. Um, to the question of how often do you refactor due to tightly coupled logic and or poor code, like, quite high, um, I'm, I'm sure you can see, but um, over 40% um, uh, actually do have to refactor stuff frequently. So this is a significant amount of people in, 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 in the whole pool of developers. And then uh, can you reuse code as you'd like, um, and as often as you'd like to? It's very big, I can see, as you can see, um, it's almost half and a half. Um, and would a better code structure make you faster? I think this is what everyone wants. 
And surely this is what every business wants at the end of the day. It's also a very staggering portion uh, of, of people that answer yes. Um, more in the size were more in the maybe, but this all takes me to an everlasting question. Have you heard about cyclomatic complexity, which is the danger behind all this? 39.3% said no, the rest 60% either lied or Googled very fast what it means. Um, but let's, let's take it as, as it is. Now, on a very short notice, I, would, I don't presume to give you a, 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 a lesson on these topics, but cyclomatic complexity is what defines how complex a code structure is um, or program is um, based on ramifications and the, the, the intensity of it. And this is usually tied to how easy it can scale and the problems that it pr brings you or not. One way to fix this, or at least to tame uh, cyclomatic complexity issues, is to follow the typical solid principles. Um, the sing single responsibility principle, which states that a classroom module basically has to have a focus on a single responsibility, so it only does one thing. Uh, the open close principle, which uh, translates into your code should be easily extendable when you need it to, rather than having to modify the way that it works, because it requires more refactoring and it's, it's prone to bigger issues. The list of substitution principle, which is very tied to how you're able to replace parts of your system downstream or upstream without affecting the different parts of it. And I'm oversimplifying for sake of time, but it is roughly this. Uh, interface segregation um, principle basically states that more interfaces is better than general purpose interface. So uh, a lot of tiny things better than a big thing. It's like fighting a hundred sized ducks or a horse sized duck. Um, and <laughs> dependency inversion principle is mostly uh, uh, connected to picking abstractions over concretions. So either downstream or upstream of your code, you either, you rather push abstractions and use abstractions without changing the overall structure than actually doing like ifs and else to pick where the code goes in itself. So to help me tackle this, um, I, from inspiration in different areas and, and, and code bases, a lot of blog posts, a lot of people, I, I, I usually pick these four patterns to help me out build my code base. Um, handlers, finders, services, and values. Uh, we're gonna go a bit into this. This is the main highlight of my presentation. Um, and, and, and I'll start by talking about the interaction schema. So of course, um, these patterns are sort of known. You can use them in, in, in different ways, shapes and forms, but the way that they prime is when you actually create a, a, a map, how they interact and reduce the responsibility of each of them, right? So this is the most important part of how they use um, these patterns. Each of them is responsible for handling a type of thing and overall they deliver um, um, a typically better code base. This can translate into uh, what you have, for instance, in Phoenix applications, uh, controller view and template, and you can use handlers at the controller level, or at finder and services, uh, each of them can call values. And then you can also use a value to return the, from the view to the template or just to the API. Uh, I'm gonna go into all the, these details and what they mean and how they work, but usually this is how it overall looks. In our case study, what I did was a very simple Phoenix API. Uh, it takes in a, a name as a, a query uh, parameter. Then there's a handler that will take over it. Um, we'll create, uh, we have a service and a finder. Service will create the user. The finder will just query an external API. It's Marvel's API. We're gonna search for superheroes and then we return a JSON response uh, to the view and to the EN user. Very simple use case. This is how it looks, very simple get, and this is the, the reply. So about the handlers. Handlers uh, are orchestrators from the top level. They don't actually create data structures or change data structures directly. They orchestrate other services finders and get values to return the data to um, the upstream uh, code. As I said, they never really change the data itself. What they do 
is they, they, they use services, finders, and values to sort of command them and build the things that we want to do. Um, this is a, a simple example. This is an action on a controller, um, an example that I explained a bit briefly. So we have a, a, a handler that calls um, a function to handle, as it were, um, the query that comes from the API and then just returns the, the result. So what we get here is very simple and very thin layer on the controller level, super easy to read and to maintain. What is good to uh, tackle here is that, and, 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 and retain here is that handlers are usually domain driven. It's business logic uh, code that typically only know about the business space where they live. This means that they translate the same um, to the lower, label, uh, lower levels. Um, and as you can see here, you can add more uh, use cases, exp uh, um, um, expand it, and add as many function, uh, public functions as you'd like, uh, each within the same type of domain, never other domains. On to services. So uh, as I said, services are the action arm of our solution. They will be the agents that implement changes throughout our, our infrastructure and app. Um, they're now not at the business level, more, more on the applicational level, can be highly reused. They can invoke finders and values or other services, but they cannot invoke the upstream, so new, new uh, structures. Uh, and this means that we will expose only one function, public function, just call, sort of our uh, agreement and contract um, and we will use this to, as again, to be the sort of the writing arm of our um, uh, uh, solution. In a way, this is, this, will, this is typically the most used option uh, pattern. Um, it's very common to nest them um, and reuse them um, across the app, but it's very good because you can just replace them any point in time. And given that the contract is always the same and the function call, the RD uh, as well, you'll just will you be able to replace the entire function definition by something else, either something not local, um, an API, or actually re regress and do it local instead of a uh, third party service. Um, this is how we call um, uh, service uh, dot call and then the, the argument. Again, super simple. Um, and it's focused on the abstraction and rather than the complexity of invoking something. Uh, this is how it looks like. We're going to create a user. So first what we do is, is use a context to create a user. We also invoke another service um, to log something very simple. Also highly tied, uh, connected to the service. We can never use a service to do other things like create a bank account, create an address. This is just focused on the user uh, itself. Finders. Um, very similar to services, but now we're focused on reading on just the lookup part of things. Um, all very common uh, uh, limitations and, and, and abilities and finders will only call values. They will not call more finders due to keeping complexity uh, limited so that we're able to quickly uh, refactor them without going into much detail. The problem with services is that they can rewrite a lot of our app and database and other uh, items and actions that we need but the finders, this is exactly what we need to focus on when we need to read. So it's best, I found it best through experience that we keep a finder always very simple and don't use it to do crazy stuff in, in the process. Again, this is the contract um, dot find. You only expose one single uh, function, nothing else to keep it as simple as possible. Then within the finder, this one is a bit more, more uh, bigger because we're actually going to the Marvel API and, and getting some data from there um, and retrieve whatever we want to retrieve. And our last pattern, values. So values is something, um, um, it's a, a, a pattern that is actually the most complex one. It um, is used by all the other patterns to uh, relay data from one side to the other. So we, it's heavy on composition. Uh, it's the most heavy uh, used design pattern here. And it focuses on either being list or a map and nested stuff within it. What we will do is use it to uh, pass data from one item or one pattern to the other, or just to output it from the app, app itself. 
Uh, the idea here, again, we only expose a build function as a public function um, and is highly reusable as well through any part of our app, not just at one layer or uh, another. Um, very quick representation of this is a view um, uh, uh, function and we're calling a registration to build another value. Now, the composition part of values and the best part of values comes here. Usually when in our apps, we need to like build a, a complex data structure. Uh, it involves merging and then picking objects, doing nums and, and cycle through and blah, blah, blah. And then it, it ends up in very sort of spaghetti code like, which is kind of ugly. And to be honest, to refactor and maintain, it's just a pain in the butt. So the purpose of using values and composition, as you can see the alias for code being a value, um, this value is it's a module that is responsible for composing and easy composing this message. So what we do is abstract a lot of um, functions, not a lot, just a few, that will help us build whatever we want to build. So that the interface is always very abstract, independently if it's a list, a map, or whatever, or struct, whatever you want to return it. Um, this is an example of the, the composer. I know you can't see it very well um, because it's quite extensive. What it does, it um, basically defines an init, add, accept, and only. These are the four only uh, um, functions that we use so that we can build and map whatever uh, uh, data structure we want as easy as we want. Values only focus on this and we'll always use it sort of as a helper uh, to pass data back and forth. And it can even, uh, as we have it here, uh, use it to clean up data, like from change sets and stuff like that, when we just want to output something for the user and, and, and they don't really need to know more than that. How about the folder structure? So there are two ways to go about it. You can easily see that on the left, that's just it. On the right, th this is half of it, right? So if you think about all the things that you implicitly as a developer think about when you look at the code, um, that's quite a difference. So the cognitive load is a bit different. Not to say that this has impact directly on how the compiler uh, runs uh, uh, and, and, and process things and how it works in runtime, but as a human, these are the paths that you go through even though you don't realize it. But I did do a bit of performer, uh, performance analysis. Um, the truth is, at the end of the day, I ran uh, 10 series of 1,000 th uh, repetitions each uh, to compare the, the same solution with four, the four patterns or just the extended version of it with like spaghetti code. And it's head to head. Uh, very hard to depict any, any change into it. Um, now, the code base is not very big. That's granted. So in very big, big very, very big code bases, you may see a few differences. It's hard to tell where. Uh, we have yet at remote to see an impact on this. It's not the first time I use this pattern, um, but I would assume that for really um, performance intensive applications that use or use very big payloads, this may have some impact. And the reason why, uh, so this is the comparison on only the values. So if you rec recall, the values are on the pattern that copy a lot of um, data structures back and forth and actually change them. Of course, there's no mutation here, but what happens is that as you pass the data along, you will make a lot of copies and you will use double dispatch often rather than just the execution. So the performance of values is quite heavily um, affected, though we're talking about less than 0.5 microseconds to one and a half microseconds. So in the general view of things, it's as the previous slide showed, is not uh, very impactful and we're not even taking consideration network time. So this is just local execution time. Though, as I said, for highly performant code bases or very big data structures, this may have a bit of impact. Um, composition, the human part of things. So whenever there's a new uh, um, uh, code requirement or change, it is faster uh, to get, get your results because the way that the structure is, is built, it's mostly through composition uh, and you can just easily plug and play stuff or even add uh, a few elements here and there through values if you need it. So uh, you don't need to make a lot of changes to the structure itself. There's 
at the beginning, I have to admit a bit of overhead because you have to create the structures and how the code works. Though it's not very impactful, I'd say that it's less than 5% impact, 10% impact is if, 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 if that. But the outcome is amazing uh, because of the, the speed at which you can scale something up or down code base wise. Uh, and then at the end, more files, but smaller files. I mean, some people do prefer bigger files. I personally, throughout the different teams that I, I ran and, and, and worked with, more files always beats uh, the game. And then at the end of the day, you have less apologies to make whenever you onboard someone into your code base. Um, and that's it. Thank you. And um, I hope you enjoyed my TED talk. Um, if you want to reach out to me, um, just use my, my, my credentials and, and username, Twitter, email, whatever you feel like. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo. Uh, we have two questions at the moment in the platform. Cool. Uh, one says, uh, how does that map to processes? Um, it's orthogonal. So it means uh, we actually use this in a few cases where you can use, for instance, a gen server within a service um, and it's completely abstracted. So it's completely orthogonal. You can use it whichever layer you want, um, but it doesn't affect how the code is structured overall. Um, in our case, we do use it um, in a few use cases, mostly in, in, as I said, in services, because the call is just very simple. You offload whatever you want to uh, offload. And then if you need to use later a finder to get something, you can just call uh, 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 a gen server, another process or whatever, and you treat it as an external uh, item. Okay. Uh, the following question is, uh, what was the reasons uh, you found to not use uh, Phoenix conventions, controllers, models, and views? I do use it. Um, we do use it. This is complementary. Uh, so we tend to use, as I shown in examples, within the controllers, uh, we call handlers. The reason why we don't uh, use everything uh, in it or just do all the full code there is because when you grow, I mean, for small-ish apps, it works, it's fine, more than fine, actually, performance-wise, it will take you a long while, but in terms of code base and code structure, it will, it will take you a while, um, until you, 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 I mean, it will be a while until you actually, you know, the code that you're doing there is acceptable by anyone in the team. So what I want to mean by this is that as the business logic um, gets more complex with all businesses, it's just not acceptable to have everything in the controller. Um, it, the, the, the cyclomatic complexity there is just nuts. Um, I know that in, in, in a few cases, it will still scale with the business, uh, very simple uh, controllers. And that's fine. Um, we're not super um, 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 strict on it per se, but overall, we do like to use handlers within controllers to make sure that uh, we're able to separate things and then save on code reusability and in, in, in our own sanity. And uh, a question for me that uh, when you decide or you started to think about uh, those uh, four patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, did you think about uh, other, or are you influenced by other things like uh, domain driver development, for example? Um, can, can you repeat the question again, please? Uh, uh, when you decide to use uh, those uh, names, uh, like uh, handler, services, uh, finders, and values, uh, you was uh, thinking about uh, DDD, the domain driver driven development? Um, I have, there's a lot of influence from uh, subjects like domain driven, hexagonal approach um, and, and, and the sorts. Now, all these patterns, they're quite old as well. Uh, they, my main point was how can I solve a very common and typical problem uh, without introducing a lot of overhead on a management side of things, like on the developer side of things who has to maintain things and still deliver code at the end of the day and value to customers, how can I strike a balance between those? Because what I found is that often we're with more mature structures um, or more rigid structures like pure domain driven and such, is that you will soon um, have a considerable overhead. Um, not to say that this doesn't have any overhead, but it's a lot smaller. So it's just a balance compromise of sorts. 
another question. Uh, do you have any reflections of the learning curve of these patterns for experience uh, versus novice uh, programmers? Yeah, so uh, we tend to have all the things documented uh, every month and I wrote a few blog posts in different languages with the same four patterns actually. Uh, it is typically from my experience as a developer and also as a team lead, team engineer, manager and whatnot, something very quick to grasp. Um, because the, the, the layers are so well divided and the rules are so simple, once you get going and, and start tinkering with them, um, that you get a lot of, uh, in a couple couple days maybe, you get someone uh, off the ground. The one that is a bit, sometimes that takes a bit longer to fully grasp are the values because of the composition uh, pattern. Um, some people still try to like, oh, I'm just gonna use a merge and any num to filter through when they don't need to. Um, so it's very simple. Um, and because of the simplicity of it, sometimes we tend to overcomplicate things, but I'd say tops a week is the learning curve to understand this and get going with full appreciations. Great. Uh, another question, how do you start refactoring an, an app that uh, doesn't have these patterns? Yeah, so I faced this in the past, um, blood, sweat and tears, mostly. Um, to be honest, it's, it's not about stopping the train and, and fix, uh, uh, fix the wagon, right? The purpose is when you're touching a part of the app and you change that. So if you're, you don't need to fully change something, oh, this can only be called by a handler or this can only be called by a service. No, if you find a piece of code that is clearly a service, you wrap it on a service. And then you find something that should be a finder, you wrap it on a finder. And soon enough, the upstream code will be very easily turn into a handler and, and same for the values. So every time you, you touch a part of the code base, you change that. Um, and as simple as possible, you never try to go upstream or downstream. You just try to uh, focus that and isolate that. So um, a bit piece by piece as much as possible. What I found that, that something that doesn't work is if you try to like isolate a vertical of the app and then change it all top to bottom, that's too heavy. Uh, because it will always propagate to like ramifications on the horizontal scale. Um, and then you end up having to really do all the things or get really frustrated. So it's best to just start here and there um, and you will very, very quickly achieve what you want to achieve. Okay. About the test, uh, uh, do you think that it's better to test uh, every part, uh, every handler service finder values uh, in separate way? or it's better to integrate uh, a couple of them to reduce the number of tests? Um, you can do both, honestly. Um, our typical approach is the Pareto rule. So uh, do the 80% the of the work that will take you 80% of the, of the journey. Sometimes, depends on the complexity, you can do bundle things up. The thing is you have to measure the risk. Sometimes when you bundle stuff, you run the risk of missing a few uh, uh, use cases or edge cases. The best part of using a structure like this is that at the end of the day, you can literally just write a very, very simple code because as you've seen, every function call is like one, two lines, that's it. Um, and then you can even consider like more end-to-end -end or integrated tests uh, if you wanna go fancy. Okay, and uh, do you, uh... Uh, in the open source uh, software, uh, there is uh, sometimes uh, examples uh, to show uh, some specific way to programming. Do you know if there uh, exists uh, some specific uh, um, open source uh, that is in GitHub or another repository that is using uh, those uh, patterns? No, and to be honest, in most of the things that I find, it doesn't really apply. Uh, and I'm gonna explain why. So usually this assumes um, that your code base is big enough to, for that, um, the overhead of building this to have a positive impact, right? Mm -hmm. If you start um, a typical open source, like an adapter to a database or an adapter to an API, very, very often is just a layer. It's just like a very thin abstraction layer, maybe with a couple of configuration there, uh, configurations there that you can pass along 
but that's it. So you'll actually end up trying to uh, cram like four patterns into one or two layers. So what I found is that the overhead of doing, I have actually tried to start it, but what I found is that the code was so simple, um, what it was mostly abstraction and stuff like that, it really doesn't work, it's not worth it. Um, so I guess, and from my experience of the open source I've, I've done or been involved with or used, the layers are often very thin. Um, and this implies that you have a business logic behind it and most open source stuff is mostly application on application stuff. So it is, I would caution people to think very thoroughly. It, is, it would be the same as saying, so why you're starting a company now, why don't you just use microservices or, or domain driven because it scales? Yes, it does, but is the overhead um, enough to justify that, that effort? Maybe not. So I've not seen this and honestly, I don't recommend that you start an open source project with this. This is for more business intensive stuff.